OBS is a broadcast switcher. It's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a way to switch between different media sources, different images, different cameras, all that stuff. There's a lot to learn in OBS. It's a huge program. Uh, there are a few things that you should know, and I have 10 things that streamers, I feel, need to know about OBS. We're going to start right now, not waste any time. Number one, use the Alt key to crop. Okay, this kind of blew some people's minds. So here we are. I have like my picture here, that handsome devil. And, uh, you know, you can grab these, uh, you can grab these handles and size everything. But uh, often you don't need the whole image. As you can see, my image actually ends where my shoulders are, right? So I don't need the whole image. So if I hold down the Alt key and I grab a handle, this, now this might happen. Okay, so I'm cropping, uh, I'm, I'm cropping just from this, this part here. If I don't hold down the Alt key, then I'm sizing. See how I'm sizing? But if I hold down the Alt key, and I'll show you another way. Check this out. If I right click on this, and go to transform. And this is the Mac version, but it's the same in the PC version. And I say, edit transform. Okay, not a lot of people even know this is here. Transform is here. Not a lot of people know edit transform is here. And what that'll do is bring up this. And this this sets up like everything that's gonna happen with the transform, the position alignment, the bounding box. Usually the bounding box will be set to scale to inner bounds. Okay, and that's what this is doing right now. It's scaling to the inner bounds of that um, transform. What I want to do is it makes it easier sometimes. I'll just switch it to no bounds, right? If I switch that to no bounds, okay, and I hit close. Now when I hold the Alt key, I can crop. Notice how it shows up green. I can crop the image. And this kind of blew some people's minds. This is such an easy shortcut. And it works It works with anything, even this, this text box up here. Hello world. I can hold down the Alt key and crop the hello world, all right? So try that out using the Alt key to crop. Use, number two, use groups, okay? So there will become a time where your sources get so filled that it scrolls down the screen. Well, you know, you can actually group together similar uh, things. So if I have these two um, images here, actually, if I add another text element, so I go text and say, okay, I would normally name it, always name your sources. Don't just, don't just click okay. Um, Manu Smith, I'm gonna put my name there and say okay. So uh, I have Hello World, I have Manu Smith, and I have me. Now I can take the, I can highlight those two with the shift key, all the text elements, right click and say group selected items. Then it says, what's the name? And I can say text elements, E-L-E-M-E-N-T-S, boom. So now I'm not cluttering my interface. Notice all my text elements, or within that group. And what's really nice about this is you can lock the group. If I lock the group, okay, I can't move them. But also if the group is locked and the elements inside are unlocked, I still can't move them. The entire group is locked. So I'm locking the group level. If I unlock the group, then I can grab somebody. So that's kind of nice. Also real quick, this is like 2.A. You can multi-select, all right, um, if you have if you have a bunch of elements you want to select and they're the only things that are unlocked, if I uh, draw a bounding box over them, now I'm multi-selecting and I can also multi-scale and I can multi-alt-key crop, all right? So there's some things that'll help you, but group your, group your elements. Another thing is you can use scenes within scenes, which is terrific. So what I mean by that is like, okay, so we have, uh, I'll switch over to scene two, which is my opening animation. And on top of that, I threw in this image of a uh, pinball machine, strange thing pinball. Now imagine that, you know, let's, let's take this source here and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my alt key and I'm gonna, I'm gonna crop in a little bit, crop in there, crop in there, whatever. I'm, imagine that I'm creating like this, this scene that has all the elements that I want and I want that to sit behind me. I want this guy here, and I want a text element maybe that says, um, I know I'm moving fast, but but I'm just trying to show you. Uh, breaking news. Breaking news, great. So I want this to act as kind of a background for another scene. Okay, so this scene is now defined as a container. Now, if I create a new scene, I'm gonna go plus, create a new scene, I have a blank scene. And I can add my image 
right? Uh, add existing. I don't remember which one it was. I think it was that. Yes. Okay. There's my image. I can go add a scene now and say scene three, add existing uh, scene two. I mean, okay. There we go. Now I've added that entire scene. Now it always defaults to uh, being on top. And uh, boy, this well, that's going to be loud no matter what. It's going to default on being to being on top. Um, but notice how if I drag it to the bottom, now my image is here and I'm contained kind of, I'm on top of it, but I'm, I'm contained inside the scene or I'm sitting over the scene. Basically, if you use scenes as uh, uh, groups of objects, now I'm able to grab this entire scene and size it, see? And once again, I can size it, I can alt key, I can crop it, okay? So I've done some pretty complex scenes by creating scenes and then using scenes within scenes. All right, so there you go. Uh, let's keep going. Number, I don't remember which number, number four, create profiles, okay? I'm gonna go back to my initial scene. A lot of people ask me, what's the difference between a profile and a scene collection? Well, a profile, stores everything that is in settings. So if you come in here and you change your stream type to say Facebook, and then you change your output types and your encoders and stuff, and your bit rate for Facebook and your microphone selections, everything in here will be saved under that profile. Okay. So that when you go choosing different profiles and you say new profile and you start to, it'll always save under the profile that you're currently in. So that's where profiles get saved. The settings get saved in profiles. Scene collections is, is exactly that. You can have, I have a few scene selections right here. I don't have many because it's my Mac and I don't usually use the Mac, but um, here's my MPT3K scene collection right here. Okay, so this is what I use. Whenever I'm ready to stream pinball, I choose the scene collection. But if I want to do this tutorial again, um, I'm gonna choose that scene collection. So that's the difference between profile and scene collections. Okay, here's another one. When you're working with lots of sources in a scene, lock everything that you don't want to move. Basically what I mean by that is when you when you start to use, when you start to populate your scenes with uh, sources and it, you have a lot of sources and you wanna move something and I accidentally grab you know one thing over the other. Um, like say I want this, but I accidentally grab the background. Oh no, there's no undo in OBS. So you have to manually find where it was before and it's frustrating because if I miss me, I'm grabbing, I'm grabbing the background unless I specifically grab me. Now I can't even grab me. One thing that's, that you can do is you can highlight the element in the sources first and then go for the move. But what's even better is just lock everything. Lock everything once it's set. When you want to move that element, say I want to move me, I unlock it and then I move it. That way I don't miss it. If I miss it, I'm just doing this, but if I grab it, so lock all the things you're not using. It's, it's annoying when you don't have an undo and you've moved something that you made pixel perfect. Uh, program and preview, what do they mean? So this is important. In OBS, when you open OBS, you're basically in preview mode. Now, a lot of people do this and never even know that the, uh, the program mode exists, okay? This is preview mode. We usually just broadcast on preview mode, okay? What that means in the broadcast world is there's the preview and there's the program. The program goes out to your audience. That's what you're broadcasting to your audience. The preview is for the editor or the switcher to see what's, to prepare things for what's coming next, okay? And here's why it's important. If you never ever clicked studio mode, studio mode is when you're actually doing kind of a big production or a bigger production that requires a little more than just one screen. As pinball streamers, we set up one screen and then we just switch, we switch scenes between that one screen. And we never deal with studio mode, but when you go into the bigger things and like even, even I'm sure like Papa TV and stuff like that, they'll do studio mode, which um, I'm not gonna get into it because it's a whole different video, but in short, you now have, you see it says program up here, and it says preview here. Program is what's currently being sent to your audience, okay? And preview is what you are preparing. Here's an example. 
if I had a separate screen, and we do this at uh, City Champ, if we go watch, I have a separate screen. We have one big screen that's broadcasting, not only streaming out, but broadcasting in the in the hall, so people can watch the current games that are happening. If I right click on this and I say full screen, full the full screen of this program is going to go to this monitor. Okay, that's how I get this program screen over to the screen in 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 the in the in the house. Okay, so not only is this program monitor going out to my streamers or my stream viewers, but this right click, this is going to go to this monitor. That's how I broadcast like the nice big play field to people. Preview on the other hand, now watch this. I have preview over here. I can switch scenes and it doesn't affect the program scene. So I can switch scenes again and it doesn't affect the program scene until I do a transition. Okay. And that's why the transitions show up. I'll say this transition is a cut and I just did a cut. Okay. Cut. I just did a cut. Or if I choose the, the pull down, right? I can say now this transition is going to be a fade. Okay. Now, whatever's going to program goes to your viewers. That means I can switch around here and see what I'm going to, you know, prepare next. I can even go to sources. Okay. In the scene, double click and change things up. And it doesn't affect what's going out to my streamers. Like I said, I'm going to turn this off. Most streamers, not just pinball, but most streamers are only exist in the preview mode. Um, and here's one more thing about this mode. Now you can understand if you want to see a full screen view of your OBS setup. If I right click now, it says full screen projector preview. That's why it says preview there. Full screen projector preview. Where, well, what screen do I want to preview? I hit this. Boom. It goes full screen. You see that? Remember in studio mode. If I right click, it says full, full screen, full screen projector program. Okay. Over here, I could say full screen projector preview. Okay. And so that's how you can get some more color. We're not going to go into studio mode right now, but I want you to be aware that most people are using it in preview mode only. There is a whole different world to OBS. All right. Number eight, because I know we're at number eight. Make sure the output settings are appropriate for the place you're streaming to. Okay. So for example, let's take a look at the settings and I'm going to give you an example for Twitch because that's the one that I know the best. Um, if we come to settings and we go to output. Now, if you have, this is, there's a lot involved in this thing, but I'm going to give you the, the bare minimum. If you have an NVIDIA graphics card, you want to make sure that this encoder, this is a, this is a Mac, so it's not going to show up, but that your encoder is set to NVENC. It should say either NVENC or NVENC new. Set it to that because that will put most of the compositing that or all of the compositing that OBS has to do on uh, the graphics card, which will lighten the load for your CPU. It will also create a better looking stream. X.264, X.264 is a, is a pretty good stream, uh, but it's heavily reliant on the CPU. NVENC is an amazing stream that's not reliant on the CPU at all. So you see your CPU uses drop to almost nothing. Uh, it, and in, if you have X264, try that. If you have AMD, which is another place, this is another graphics card, try that. It's not the greatest, but at least it'll take the load off your CPU. Um, for Twitch, for example, so we're going to set, set our rate control to CBR, which is constant bit rate. And you want to, for pinball, pinball streamers, you want to be between 3000 kbps and 6000 kbps. If your, if your internet upload speed can handle 6,000 kbps, do it. If it can't, go to three. Here's how you can tell. Do a speed test. Go to speedtest.net and check your internet speed. If your upload speed is, say, 10 megabits per second, I would be worried about using six because you're up, you're, this, the setting you set here should be about half your actual upload speed. Okay. So if you're at 10, like me, I usually set it around four so I can have like a megabit, a uh, uh, one kilobit of headroom. Um, if you're at 20, 30, 40, feel free to set that to six. The higher the bit rate, the better your stream is going to be. Not the faster your frames are going to be, but the better the quality of your stream is going to be. Um, for keyframe interval, we're going to use two and the CPU preset. Play around with it, but very fast seems to be decent for most people. The higher you set it, the less CPU it uses, um, but it could tank your performance. So be careful with setting CPU preset. And the other other thing is on the, um, if I go to video, 
For pinball streamers, if you can handle 1920 by 1080 at 60 frames per second, go for it. Now, if you are not, if your elements and everything are not set for 1080, for 1920 by 1080, if your cam, this, your base canvas is what your, what this screen is going to look like. This is now, this base canvas is set to 1920 by 1080, which means HD, which means this canvas here is set to 1920 by 1080. Okay. Your output resolution should match that. Some people think that if you set your base canvas to HD and you change your output resolution to like 1280 by 720, that that's a good thing. It might be a good thing in the world of non-streaming, but in the world of OBS where your CPU has to do now that scaling on every single frame, it's not worth it. Just make your, make your base canvas and your output the same so that OBS and your CPU and your GPU don't have to do extra work to downscale the whole thing. And adversely, you don't upscale. So that's kind of crazy, right? Um, so we're going to keep on with that. So this is really super basic, um, for the output settings. Um, maybe sometime I'll do a more in depth, um, a more in depth video about output settings. Nine is audio tips. One of the things I want to tell you about audio here is that when you are streaming, your microphone should be reaching the notice where my mic microphone is reaching right now. It's reach. It's mostly in the green, but sometimes it flicks up into the yellow. Most a lot of people say don't let it touch the yellow. Actually, but um, sometimes if you if it doesn't touch the yellow, it's not quite enough. So I like it to sit somewhere like my peaks are peaking around you know negative fifteen dB, which I think it's fine. You really have to listen to your stream afterwards to notice. Uh, some condenser mics will be really loud. Some dynamic mics will be really quiet and vice versa. So you just have to test. Uh, the other thing is if you're using a microphone, go to advanced audio properties and then mono that microphone, set it to mono because microphones are not stereo, they're mono. So that it'll make sure it comes out both ears for your viewers or your listeners. And make sure the output level is high enough so that you don't have to actually adjust the dB here in the volume level here. You can pump it up a little bit from here, but this will also raise the noise floor. So not only you bring up your system, you bring up your signal, you bring up your noise also. Try and get a system that has a microphone that has enough power uh, that it doesn't drain all the USB power out of your, your laptop or your desktop or whatever, all right? That's a basic rule of thumb on the audio though. Make sure that your audio is not hitting the red. It could, it could hang out around the yellow that's probably fine. Uh, green is good for background noise and stuff, background music and stuff like that. Finally, the 10th OBS tip has nothing to do with OBS. It's lighting. I see a lot of pinball streamers. They have a play field. They might have pin stadiums built in. Now, pin stadiums in and of themselves are great, but sometimes they have a mode where they actually flash on and off or they turn off or they're not, they're not set to you know, make this, make the table really bright. That's what extremes are for. Pin Stadium extremes will just stay on and they're lighting the table. And if you have them set up the right way, they will also light you as the talent. Lighting is key. People, you're using cameras. Cameras do nothing without light. So if you ask me again, why does my, <laughs> why does my, my play field look bad or my, my camera look bad? I'm going to ask you what lighting are you use, using? Welcome to the world of video cameras and video production. Lighting is everything. I know Don't Panic Flip, George over Don't Panic Flip, not only has extremes on his tables, but he's hitting the table with like external light also. And he is well lit. If you look at Don't Panic Flip, you'll see a stream that is 100% perfect. He's well lit. I will see a lot of streamers. Their play field will be spotless. It'll be 60 frames per second. And I'm watching a dark shadow of a person play, which, you know, if you just want to show footage of your, of your game, that's fine. But if you want to show reactions too, people want to, people want to feel like what you feel when the ball drained or whatever, make sure you're lit also. So when I do my stream, I actually have two lights on me, on my face, in addition to lighting of the table and, and whatever else I want to let. Lighting is key. Light, light, light. Okay. That's it. Uh, I think I've gone long enough. 10 things I think pinball streamers should know at least new ones should know about streaming in OBS. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to check out uh, Second String Silver Ball 
which is which is our podcast, which we have a ton more information about pinball streaming. And that's it. I'll see you guys later. MPT3K out. Peace.